in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to His side. With love and strength for each new day, He will make a way. He will make a you all in Jesus precious name. Let us all turn our Bibles to the book of Esther chapter 1. We will read the whole chapter. It's a little long chapter um, but still it's a wonderful story to just read along and uh, we'll also read one more verse after that and then we will prayerfully prepare to consider and receive God's word. Esther chapter 1, verses 1 to 22. Let me read verse 1. Please read the alternate verses. Esther Grandam, Mother Tadhyam, Mother T. Adhyam Anta Chadukuna. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, this Ahasuerus which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, over an hundred and seven and twenty provinces, that in those days, when the king Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the palace. In the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto all his princes and his servants, the power of Persia and Media, the nobles and princes of the provinces being before him. When he shewed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty, many days, even an hundred and fourscore days. And when these days were expired, the king made a feast unto all the people that were present in Shushan, the palace, both unto great and small, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace, when there were white and green and blue hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple, to silver rings and pillars of marble and beds were of gold and silver upon a pavement of red and blue and white and black and marble. Verse 7. And they gave them drink in vessels of gold, the vessels being diverse from one another, and royal wine in abundance according to the state of the king. And the drinking was according to the law, none did compel. For so the king had appointed to all the officers of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure. Also Vasti, the queen, made a feast for the women in the royal house which belonged to King Ahasuerosh. On the seventh day, when the, king, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehunam, Pishta, Harbona, Pikta, and Abakta, Zitar, and Karkas, the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Ahasuerus the king. Verse 11, to bring Vasti the queen before the king with the crown royal, to shew the people and the princess her beauty, for she was fair to look on. But the queen Vasti refused to come to, at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. Then the king said to the wise men, which knew the times, for so was the king's manner toward all that knew law and judgment. And the next unto him was Kasherna, Setar, Admata, Tarshish, Meres, Mersena, and Mekmuna, Mekmukan, sorry the seven princes of Persia and Media, which saw the king's face and which sat the first in the kingdom. Verse 15, What shall we do unto the queen Vasti according to law, because she had not performed the commandment of the king Ahasuerus by the chamberlains? And Memukan answered before the king and the princess, Vasti the queen had not done wrong to the king only, 
but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus. Verse 17, for this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes when it shall be reported. The king Ahasuerus commanded Vashti, the queen, to be brought in before him, but she came not. Likewise, all the ladies of Persia and Media say this on this day unto all the king's princes, which have heard of the deed of the queen. Thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. Verse 19, if it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, that it be not altered, that Vashti come no more before the king Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. And when the king's decree which he shall make shall be published throughout all his empire, for it is great, all the wives shall give to their husbands honor, both to great and small. Verse 21, And the saying pleased the king and the princess, and the king did according to the word of Memukan. For he sent letters unto all the king's provinces, into every province according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language, that every man should bear rule in his own house, and that it should be published according to the language of every people. Let us read chapter 4, verse 14 as well, and then we'll pray. Chapter 4, verse 13 and 14. Let us read these two verses all together. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Let us pray and look to the Lord. Shall we? Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for this privilege you are giving that we may come together around your precious word from this wonderful book of Esther. We thank you, Lord, for how you are the Lord God omnipotent, who reigneth on high, who is seated on the throne in absolute control. Lord, and how you are our true provision and our provider in that you have provided the greatest provision in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, along with him, why would you not provide everything that we need, Father? And so, Lord, we thank you, we praise you, recognizing that you work all things for our good all together, Lord, uh, that it might bring glory and honor to thee. Lord, as we begin to understand your precious word in and through this book of Esther, we pray that you may speak to me, through me, to each one of us, and that in the receiving of your word, our lives may be challenged, our lives may be cleansed and consecrated to live worthy of your name that is upon our lives, thanking and praising you, for we ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As we begin this book of uh, Esther, I praise God that uh, we have a platform set since our uh, morning sermon touched on the aspect of provision, or the true providence, in fact, or the providence fact. Um, we'll be coming to the, the same uh, aspect of providence in a very different way, uh, but nonetheless, it is uh, a wonderful uh, thing to take note of all that we come to be encountered with as we come to the book of Esther. When you look, when you look through the history of how people have come to see the key themes that are there in the book of Esther, you might find some interesting uh, sermon titles that I'll, come, I, I'll bring about and you might be surprised as to the number of titles that will be there. The first one that I bring about is 
someone has titled their sermon as history's first Hitler. Uh, well, we'll see that in chapter 3, but uh, not only that, uh, there is also a girl who won the beauty pageant, or pageant, or I don't know how to say that rightly also. No. <laughs> when we take a look at how these titles are made, uh, it also talks about the queen and the beauty, and queen of beauty and courage. Those are the some titles that people have given. Um, also, another one was very interesting, which connects to what I'm going to share a little, which is Esther, the invisible God in action. Many of us have come to read this book in our childhood, since you're, if you are from a Christian background in Sunday school, and a number of times that you would have read this story. Um, some of the interesting aspects of this book is that you would not find the name God mentioned at all in this particular book. You all might be aware of that. Um, and we will look at certain characteristics of this book and also certain things about the timeline. Let us begin by looking at, I will introduce the, the theme as to why we can consider it to be true providence in the, in the, in the points that we will discuss. But uh, suffice us to say that we live in a world that is not so filled with manifested miracles, like the times of the children of Israel or the times of the early church, where God's manifestation in and through the miracles that he did were so profound that uh, God's presence was so felt, obviously, both in the church or amidst the people of God and those that heard about what God of the Bible did, whether it be the surrounding nations of the children of Israel or those who have heard far and wide about the kind of God the children of Israel had. But unlike that, today, you and I don't get to see such manifested manifestation of God's glory and miracles. It's almost like God is invisible. He's, he's like, um, he's silent or sometimes he is not responding as he used to, as in the times of old where he intervened and did miraculous interventions. It is not so in these last days. And so in such a way, when we see our times, just like the times of Esther, and as we see the book of Esther unfold before us, it is not something that God is an active participant or even to be seen as someone who is being mentioned. The word God itself is not found there. Even as godly as Mordecai and Esther and others were, they don't even mention the word God. So is our times exactly in how the times of Esther were. And uh, so when we look at that, in the midst of all that, when you see that though God is totally invisible in that he's not being mentioned, you cannot miss the supernatural timing-based acts that he did through day to to day-to-day -day, uh, decisions and thoughts and choices that people had. And so is it even today, in our lives, God works in similar such ways. It doesn't have to be that He has to always work in, He has to always work in a way that He will be glorified uh, by some manifested manifestation of the events. Now, that said, we would see, as we move forward, that uh, there is a timeline of Esther. Looks like there's some problem with the, um, with the audio uh, from, okay, let's uh, move on. So the timeline of Esther and the events that happened is in the Medo persian kings that we all know that after the time of Daniel, there was this, Darius the king and then Cyrus and uh, beyond that there comes another Darius one 
And Ahasuerus, this king, who is also called in the Greek uh, Septuagint, he was mentioned to be as Xerxes. And, uh, but nonetheless, Xerxes or Ahasuerus, uh, it's like uh, a title that is carried on. A number of kings were mentioned as Xerxes, Arthur Xerxes, as he comes next after Xerxes. It's like Pharaoh. You might say Pharaoh, but which Pharaoh are we talking about? There are different names like that. This word Xerxes is also reused like that. Now, and Ahasuerus, uh, this king, is a Persian king. And uh, as we see, one other interesting thing about this book is that in the very first verse, you and I come across the mention of the name India, right? Our own country. Sometimes we might think the Bible is a foreign book and it doesn't even talk about our country. Our people are forgotten. God is not even bothered whether we are existing or not. And here is a book where in the very first verse we get to see the very country that is named is our own country. And uh, so this is a very interesting book. I was pleasantly surprised when I first read after I came to Christ that the God of the Bible knows that there is a country called India. I was... Uh, uh, I was presuming not so, uh, but it is not so. God, in Acts chapter 17, we read, it is he who formed the nations and formed the boundaries. And he is, he is the one who knows and he is letting all things happen in such a way that they would perhaps seek him and find him. So this God of the Bible is truly the king of kings and he is sovereign. And so, in that sense, the key characters that you and I find here is uh, Ahasuerus, the king, or King Xerxes, um, and Queen Vasti. We're going to see that she is introduced in chapter 1, and uh, that's all that she will be in chapter 1, and after that you wouldn't find her. Um, then comes Queen, after Queen Vasti, we come to see about the Jew Mordecai, we would begin to see and understand from chapter 2 who Mordecai is and uh, how he is a cousin for Esther, the queen, and how he adopts this orphan girl to be raised up uh, when she lost her parents. So we're going to look at these, three, these few characters. And finally, in chapter 3, we get to be introduced to the enemy of the Jews called Haman. I titled in Wicked Haman, it's my title, the Bible doesn't say that. And uh, the reason being he's called as an enemy and the strategies that he had made, made me to put that wicked as a title. Now, quickly, we're going to see some highlights. As I said, this country, our own country is mentioned here. There's also an absence of the word God, as I mentioned about that. and. Uh, this book is primarily about putting forth the story that has happened in factual form. It doesn't bother so much about giving out the moral implications of whatever has happened. We are not to draw moral conclusions from it and apply as moral principles for our own lives. Because you and I might take this as an opportunity to say, um, Oh yeah, God approves of beauty pageants and uh, there is a, a way to go for it and even to go on to be married to someone who is not a child of God as King Ahasuerus was not, he was a pagan king and uh, Queen Esther as she became queen was going to get married to someone who is not uh, in the in, in the kingdom of God or someone who doesn't even know this great God. And so you and I are not to draw any moral principles from it. And uh, it only plainly states about the facts that have happened and the story that unfolds in a narrative format. And uh, so we have to be careful in navigating through the story. And uh, also the last thing that we find as highlight is about this festival called Purim that comes out. When I first heard about this festival, we all know where our thoughts go, right? <laughs> we don't have to. <laughs> One of our favorite breakfast items that we would think of. And uh, I, I 
I pleasantly was, maybe they are eating that is what I, I thought, which is why they call this festival that way. But not so. The word Purim, as we read in chapter 9, we would get introduced to that, is a festival. And the word Purim comes as a lot or a piece. It's their lot to feast and celebrate God's great deliverance. It is their lot. And that's why in, in, uh, in Hebrew it was called as Purim and uh, that became a festival. This is one among the other festivals apart from those that were in, given by Moses in the first five books. This and another festival called Hanukkah are the two other Jewish festivals that the Jews continue to celebrate. They came through after the time of Moses and Purim comes from the time of Esther and uh, the festival of Hanukkah comes in the time of Maccabees. So those are the two festivals that we would see. Now these are some highlights, nothing much to draw from there. As we move forward, we see there are some key themes that I want us to take note. As I said, the great theme of the providence of God is something that we cannot miss. Although God is passive and invisible, He is actively intervening in simple day-to-day -day actions and activities to let His will come to pass and His deliverance and His faithfulness be seen for the promises that He had given. And so, this is a true story of the true providence that you and I would come to take note of. Not only in how He provides, providence as we were introduced in the morning, is about He sees to provide uh, Jehovah Jireh. In that we come to see that He will provide. That's where we come to see this, um, this doctrine of God's providence that comes out. And in that provision of God, there is something about the timing of God that we, and we have to take note. God is a timely provider. He's not too early, He's not too late. He is in that perfect timing of how He acts. And that is what we would find to see through the pages of Esther that His timing of how the meticulous day-to-day -day choices and thoughts and acts are done in simple lives or even the lives of the greatest ones such as the kings, they are certainly going to be not out of the control of God but within the boundaries of His sovereign control and maneuvering and orchestrating to let His plans and His purposes come to pass. And that's what we find here, the timing of God. And in all that, why does God intervene in His timing? Why does He provide? It is to show His redemptive acts, His timing and His redeeming works that are the key themes from this book. The book of Esther is also in a way overarching to show that there is an enemy to the people of God who wants to destroy God's people utterly. The moment you and I are calling ourselves to be the people of God, there is a battle that is declared. There is an enemy who knows that he wants to have them become a target and he begins to wage a war and see that to the end he would want to utterly destroy. And that's what we come to see that God is up to the task of not only saving and redeeming us in our spiritual lives, but uttermost to the end He is able to save us. And that's what we see. These children of Israel were those promised children through whom God is going to bring forth Messiah and the plan of salvation. And the enemy of, this, of the children of Israel was wanting to utterly eliminate, exterminate, genocide, to completely annihilate these people so-called as Jews. And uh, so these are certain key themes. Not that I cover all of them, but some of them that we come to see. And then we see that there is this key verse. There are a couple of key verses, but I had to just uh, highlight one or two. And I put verse 14, but let's read one more verse in chapter 3, verse 8, which is a verse that, challenge, that should challenge us. Esther chapter 3, verse 8. Let's read it all together. Esther 3 verse 8. And Haman said unto King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people 
scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom and their laws are diverse from all people neither keep they the king's laws therefore it is not for the king's profit to suffer them when i read this verse it is a challenge that can someone who is seeing our lives our neighbors our colleagues our relatives can they say this about us that there are a set of people there are these so called people who call themselves as people of god who are distinct who are separate who are different they're not like the people of the world and i hope that is our testimony in one way that god's people are called to be like that and we would see how they they come about to be distinct when it matters to whom they obey ultimately yes they are good citizens of the of the country they live in and the kingdom that they are subjects of but they are ultimately they are the subjects and the citizens of a greater kingdom and when it comes to the matter of allegiance to whether it is they the earthly kingdom or the heavenly kingdom they will stand to be different and be showing themselves as the citizens of the most high god and the kingdom of the most high king and so that's a challenge that we would see and of course chapter 4 verse 14 we see the key phrase that we would take note is for such a time as this yes we see the timing of god is perfect but also there is a challenge about you and i are in the place that you and i are kept in the position that you and i are kept in the plan and in the particular that you, particular situation that you and i are kept for such a time as this meaning god is meticulously seeing what is happening in our lives and where he has placed for a brief moment of history you and i can't take things casually and ignore the grand purpose of why god has placed us it is not forever that we will be in the place in the position in in whatever particular uh, way that god has kept us it is only for such a time as this and we ought to be mindful for that brief brevity of time that you and i are living in and in that lines we are living in borrowed time in luke chapter 13 there is a gardener who is pleading to the owner of that garden he says would you not give one more year would you not add one more year let me put more fertile soil and also menu uh, and and try to do whatever i can to let this plant bring forth its fruit so is it with our lives as well that we are living in this borrowed time and for such a time as this we have what we have and we ought to be mindful of that and live in the light of that eternity that is ahead of us now quickly coming back to that key verse as we looked moving forward we would we would see some um outline of this book that i want us to bring about and uh before we look at the outline i want to give some meanings as well some interesting meanings esther the meaning of the word esther it stands for a star in one way uh and not only about a star in the babylonian culture um the reason why she was given that name is that in babylonian culture the goddess of love and war is is given this name called esther in a way that is what they hope her to be as a queen and probably that's why they gave this name now when we see this name um we don't have to draw much conclusion out of this but just as a meaning of that name there are other names which have very interesting meaning um i just would want to bring vashti vashti the queen who is replaced by esther the meaning of vashti is very beautiful lady the meaning of haman or haman as as the english bible would call it is called uh, the meaning is wrath that is the meaning um and uh, there was also another meaning uh, probably will come to it later yeah uh, the meaning of ashwarosh the meaning of ashwarosh who is a successor to darius 1 um it is that uh, 
he is given this Persian name or uh, he is one of the meanings. There are many meanings as, uh, as different names would give different meanings. One man of God says his, mean, his name means headache, it seems. <laughs> I don't know how true that is, but his, his meaning had a name called headache. And he gave a lot of headaches in, in a way that we would come to see some of it in the first chapter that we would look at. Now, these are certain meanings of the names. And now, the whole book is outlined, is structured in feasts. How many of us love feasts? If you love feasts, you would love, you would love the book of Esther. I'm not talking about love feast, but love feast, which is you and I would come to see a number of feasts in this chapter, in this book. There are three feasts uh, that they're all structured around three feasts. Actually, uh, let me give out all these verses. I don't want you to read, but you, it'll just be there for your reference. Esther chapter 1 verses 1 to 9, we find three feasts, two of which the king himself did, uh, and then finally queen does one feast. Now, after that in chapter 2 verse 18, when queen Esther is crowned to be the queen, there is a feast that king again throws. In chapter 3 verse 15, there is a feast that Haman receives from the king as a special feast. So these are the first three feasts that we would see. And then comes the feast that Esther requests. Chapter 5 verses 1 to 8, she requests two feasts. Um, and that she gets the first one in chapter 5 verse 1. Chapter 4 she requests. Chapter 5 verses 1 to 8 is the first feast. Chapter 7 verses 1 to 9 is the second feast. And finally, chapter 8 verse 17 is the feast that all the children of Jews come to celebrate. Later on in chapter 9, Verses 17 to 19, when that declaration goes out into the ends of the provinces of the Medo Persian kingdom, there is this feast of Purim that we would come to see as they hear these news of the new decree that comes out. So that's in one way we can outline this book. I want us to take note of another way, apart from the feast based outline, there's another outline that I want us to, it, it captures for us the story in an easily consumable way. The first one is, in chapters 1 and 2, it gives us the setting or the situation, where in chapter 3, we are introduced to the problem that Haman comes to create for the people of God. So the first three chapters highlight on the situation of God's people. And uh, in chapters 1 and 2, God does some work to set something up for that situation that is coming up for God's people. The second section, chapters 4 to chapter 9, gives to us about the rising action. There's a call for action for some of the gods, from the people of God, to rise up and act in some ways, such a way that God could use those simple actions of courage for a greater purposes that he would bring to accomplish. And then quickly, the resolution that comes out of all this so, this is in one way that we come to outline this story as we capture through the book of Esther. Now, now, the last few minutes that I have is going to be focused on chapter 1. Now, we read the whole chapter and uh, one thing that we see from this whole chapter is about two things simply that are happening in this chapter. The first thing that we would see is the king's Extra wing, extra cavenza, or how do I pronounce it? Sometimes I write extra wing, venza, extravaganza. Sorry, <laughs> I I got this word. I knew the uh, meaning of it, but didn't have the right pronunciation. And when we see this word, you get to get that picture right away from chapter two. He had one hundred and twenty-seven provinces. These provinces are like little kingdoms. He's the emperor of the whole known world. And what he does in chapter 3, so chapter 1 verses 3 to verse 4 is 180 days of parade or display of the glory and 
the grandeur of the Persian culture and the empire. It's probably like the Independence Day that you might have seen last uh, few weeks ago or a few days ago. It goes on and on. I mean, after some time, you'll be thinking when it will be over. Uh, four hours, it will keep going on. One after the other, one state after the other, they'll come and display what is their uniqueness, what is their speciality. And after all that, there comes this military power and might and the and the glories of the kingdom are all full at full display. And for this king, Ahasuerus, it takes 180 days to bring all that display. Such is the splendor and the grandeur of the Persian kingdom. That it takes 180 days. It doesn't suffice in one day. So much of splendor that God has blessed this. And he is there to show off that pomp and pride of his own culture and his own kingdom. Now, that said, there is also the second part of the story from verses 10 onwards uh, of what happens in the queen's expelling. Yes, we see a lot of display of pomp and pride, but also a way of how this queen has been um, expelled or has been taken away from her queenship. Now, this is in one way we can see the whole chapter. Now, a little more detail, and uh, we will take some application for our lives um, in the next few minutes and close. The detailed way that we see is, again, as I said, the first chapter, verses 1 to 9, talks about these three feasts. Chapter 1, verse 1 to 9, starting verse 5. The first feast was... A feast, sorry, uh, verses 3 to 4 gives to us the first feast that as part of all the display from all the provinces that people have come and showed, it was the city and the palace of Susa which was responsible to host them. And so for these 180 days, there was some form of feast and feeding that was happening as the display was going on. And after all that was done, when everybody went to their own province, king said, you have done such an excellent job in showing off our culture and showing, showing off the kingdoms and in being a good host. So let me give a seven days feast to the palace people who were the hosts. And after the seven days, on the seventh day, and of course there is another feast that the queen himself, herself gives, as this king was giving his feast for the palace people, the queen gives uh, to the women of the palace. So these are the three feasts that we would see. Not only the feasts, but there are certain facts that happen. Along with that feast, in chapter 1, verse 10, we come to see what happened on the last day of the feast. On the seventh day, there was a great mirth and merry merriness in the wine that was served and the drinking that happened. And in chapter 1 verse 10 we read, On the seventh day when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he happened to talk to all the princes that were there. So, probably it is said that the discussion came about that who are the most beautiful women in the whole provinces. And uh, because of the wine and all the mirth, Probably that was the discussion is what some of the historians say. We don't know the, the exact thing, but we can, we can probably expect that because of what the king does. And the king goes on to give a command. And he says in these facts, the first thing that we see is there is a rule or a charge or a decree that goes out. That the queen should show up. Probably the king wants to settle the matter once and for all and say, you will find no other beautiful women than my wife. And absolutely, and so, in the midst of that wine drinking, he calls for the queen to show up and to entertain, not just him, but also the, the provinces, uh, the princes that are there. We read about that in verse 7, verse 14, we read seven princes that are there. And all of these, they should be shut up with not having any more questions. And so she wants 
uh, he wants her to show up and uh, that they would not even talk anymore by seeing her beauty. Probably some of them say that they would, they would, uh, they, she was being called to dress up in an immodest way and show up, and which is why Vashti refused to, to obey to the command of the king. We don't know the details, but it is very clear from the record that Vashti did deny the request and she didn't obey the decree. And so there was this refusal, there was this dis refusal and also a contradiction of what the king has ordered. Now, there's one thing about how uh, Vashti, in what she did, might seem right for her. Um, there's also another thing about how she might have responded. And I call it, and it is probably this that brought her queen, um, or being the queen to be an end, that is, she probably responded not only to disobey, but also in disrespect. And that was one thing that came tough on her to totally be brought to what she would be up to. Now, when, it, when we come to this, I want us to take note of the current um, modern days that we live in. There is a propensity of taking what happens to a woman to two extremes. And I want to title it in the two uh, common words that you and I get to hear. The first extreme is called the extremism in the name of feminism. Feminism is an advocacy of women's rights on the basis of equality of sexes. Meaning, when it comes to having same pay or same roles, there should not be any distinguishing of, of whether it is a woman or a man. And so the feministic movement is about trying to fight for the women's right. Why should they get less pay? Why should they not be given every role that a man does? And so in that name, there is a fight for women's rights. That is one extreme. And on the other extreme, there is called male chauvinism. This is the other extreme where Men are considered to be superior to women in intelligence, in ability, and in strength. And so they should rightly dominate. This is the, on the other extreme. Now, sadly, there are many faiths that take this to such an extreme to say, women should not be allowed to even have any effect or any serving in the ministry or something like that. Or in, in, in our own culture in India or in a Muslim culture, you'd see such oppression that women ought not to have any role in the society. They are to be confined only to the home and kitchen. That is another extreme that they take, especially the faiths of uh, Muslim faith. They would not let women uh, to grow much higher in, in, uh, in what uh, the roles that men actually play. And so certainly, we ought to take note about this oppression that is happening. That is one extreme. On the other hand, the fight for feminism of women's rights in equal pay and uh, equal appreciation, those are all good. But the biblical worldview gives to us the right balance in between both, both of these. The right balance is that there is a distinction between how God sees both man and woman at the same level. He's made man and woman in his own image. In Genesis chapter 1, turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. We see the God of the Bible is the one who designed um, the genders that he has given. There are only two genders. And uh, primarily we see that he calls out in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 and he says, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and everyone, every creeping thing and that creepeth upon the earth. And verse 27, 
So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Both man and woman, both of them are created in his own image. And so there is this equal footing in what God values of a man and a woman. There is no greater uh, value of a man versus woman. Yes, God gave this equality before him. But having said that, God had made man and woman to complement each other but not to compete against each other. And that's where the male chauvinism is put to death. That God doesn't tolerate any kind of oppression. But he loves that we recognize these different roles that God has given. A man is called to be the husband and a father. These are exclusively man's roles. There is no interchange because a woman earns more or a woman has greater ability of uh, understanding and wisdom and knack or cleverness, he or she, sorry, she is never given the role of a husband or a leader. She's given a role to be a helper and that is by design. We read in Genesis chapter 2 verse 18, he says, Genesis chapter 2 verse 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone I will make him a help meet for him. God has given a role of a helper. But by that, there is no kind of a superiority or inferiority. God calls himself as a helper. If God himself says, I am a helper, and blessed is the one who has God of Jacob as a helper, there is nothing inferior of being a helper. Sometimes, as children, you would see, if we call our little one to be a helper to the Elder one, they're going to be offended. I'm not a helper, I'm a leader. That's often the, the case. The sad reality is, it's only a role. It's not that there is someone superior or inferior, but it's a role. Someone is to be given the role of a leading and the, and the role of helping. And both are equally important. And so is it that God has given this perfect design where, where instead of one and one doing to become what would be 1 plus 1 as 2, there is this beauty of unity that God brings out that 1 plus 1 can be more than 2, which is 3 or 4. The effect of that unity is so wonderful that in complementary work that God does, there is such beautiful unity and harmony and a grandeur and glory that God alone receives. And so, we come to see that this is misunderstood in this world and in different faith systems. And God gives us that right balance and perfect design of His. And so coming back to the book of Esther, this, um, as we come to see, my title for chapter 1 as I come to close, as I first thought is this, that I thought, this would be a good title. The title that I thought is, all this is happening for husband's honor. Imagine uh, if these people, King Ahasuerus and the seven princes, I'm sure no woman was there in that, in that hall when they were discussing. Because the moment they had a woman, probably they'll have a tough time going back home of how to deal with why they are making up this rule. And what they are concluding out of this small act of the king, uh, the queen disrespecting the king's order. So was it, is it a matter really of a husband's honor? That is, is the first assumption that you and I can come to. Why is this thing happening, this story guiding to what it is happening is that, is it to just to preserve husband's honor? When we look at the edict or the rule that comes out, and verse 16 onwards, Memu Khan, one of the seven princes, he stands up and says, if the women in the, in the empire, in the kingdoms, hear that the king had given this order and the queen disrespected and, and uh, uh, totally she had denied the order, people all over the 
I mean, the women all over the kingdom, they're going to take this as a license and an example. And they would begin to dishonor their husbands. And so they were afraid of such a repercussion. And so they make up a rule. And the rule is to, to remove, as we come back to these seven, three things that are happening in the facts. The first one is the rule that Ashurosh had given. The second one is the refusal. And that led to disrespect when she refused. And this disrespect ended up in the removal. That she was removed and she was dismissed from being the queen. And when we think about this, as we come to chapter 1 verse 19, If it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him, and let it be written among the Jews, among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, that it be not altered that Vashti come no more before the king Ashurosh and let the king give her royal estate onto another that it is better that is better than she why is this queen being dismissed and being given to another uh, another individual it is more than just a matter of the husband's honor it is a preparation for the providence of god it is a preparation for what God is going to do in using what he would orchestrate to bring forth his great providence. And when we see that, you and I would see that ordinary acts would lead to superimposing of God doing his extraordinary deeds from the simple acts of of not just the individuals who are in power, but also of those who are in common stature. And so when we see all this, we come to see that the God of the Bible is a great provider. He's a provider in a wondrous ways. We see, yes, there were some acts that were to be done, as we would come to see the act of Esther, who, who had to risk her own life, who had to stand up when the time was there, but Esther just risked her life. But there is another great man, the God-man, who gave his life. Who paid with his life. She didn't have to pay with her life. She just risked her life. To stand before the king who would release her life by raising up his scepter. But that time, when Christ gave up his life, the scepter was not raised. The God of the universe turned his face away. That your sin and mine would be born so that God's provision and providence would come to you and me exactly at the right time. As in Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 says, In the fullness of time, God sent his son that he would redeem us, we who were under the law, by the law, as sin brought about curse and eternal destruction, God chose to redeem us in the perfect timing. He gave the perfect lamb who would be slain for the sins of the whole world so that the greatest of the provision would come in that great act of God behind the scenes. Yes, man's life goes on as a normal course of events. But God superimposes his acts of great provision for his great redemption. As I close, when we think about the provision of God, you and I ought not to just see that it's only in the time of Esther or it's only in the time of our Lord Jesus Christ. But even till date, even today, he's the same God. He's the same God we read in Romans chapter 8 with these two verses we'll close. Romans chapter 8 Verse 28, we all know this. When God does things beyond our understanding, when God is silent at the very time of our need, when we, when we think, why God, why are you allowing such a thing to happen? This is the answer of God. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, we read, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to His purpose. He doesn't work everything good. You might 
seem that it is contradictory, everything that happens is not going to be good. But they would work all together, one up and one down, but all together for your and my good, because he has caused us to love him. Not only that, in the following verses, we read in verse 20, 32, this is the greatest promise that God has given in his word. As Paul writes to this book, book of Romans, in book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 32, he says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And you think about the greatest gift has already been given. And the least small needs of ours, why would he not provide? And when we think about that, we have this God of provision. We have this God of the Bible who brings to us this true provision that you and I would bow our knee and worship him for a great provider that he is. Let us pray and ask the Lord that we would always trust and relish in this true provision that comes in and through his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And ask the Lord for his blessing upon his word. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you for this great privilege that you have given to us to open thy word and to know thy heart and to know thy ways and to know thy works. Yes, you may not be acting in the same manifest way of the miracles that happened in the past, but you are still on the throne in control. The sovereign God, the Lord God omnipotent who reigneth on high. Yes, Lord, you have given your beloved son for us. Along with him, why would you not, Lord, give all things? And yes, you work all things together for our good. What a great God that we have and what provision that we enjoy. And for such a provision, we bow our knee this evening and we glorify thy name and ask that our lives would be challenged to live out for such a time as this that you have called us to the fullest purpose that you have kept us that your kingdom would come, your will be done in our lives and around our lives. Thanking and praising you, for we ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.